Dear people of God, through this Advent season, we have been tracing a marvelous theme through the Bible. God's love as a covenant of marriage. We saw in the first part that God initiates this fellowship of marriage. It's God that says, I, I love this people and I want to welcome you into this relationship with me. It's God who determines who's in that marriage union. And God, by his grace, God, by his love, sends out that invitation, makes that proposal, inviting people into that relationship of love with him. God reveals the need for marriage preparation, and we saw different dynamics of that as God initiates and then God sets out what's necessary for that relationship to be lasting and meaningful. We saw the tremendous expectation that God sets for marriage. Using language like a glorious banquet, a banquet to which we are invited not just as guests, not as spectators, but participants collectively as the bride of Christ. And this morning, we're reminded that God ensures the hope of a home restored. This is not just a dream. It's not just wishful thinking. God has so set his heart on this relationship. God has been so passionate about this love relationship with his people that he will not take no for an answer. And God ensures the hope of this home restored, of a positive, eternal relationship. We're going to explore that further this morning. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's a joyous exclamation that this family, through the grace of God, is made strong. Those bonds, those bonds are renewed and this relationship will stand. Why? Because God is with us. Emmanuel. Jesus, the Son of God, leaves the glory of heaven, comes down into our world, into our lives, in order to restore that relationship, to take what was broken and to heal it, to take our sin and to pay for it so that we can live in that love relationship with God. So that that relationship that the Bible describes as a marriage doesn't break apart, doesn't end in separation and divorce, but ends in eternal love. God teaches us through the birth of Jesus Christ that separation and divorce between us and him isn't needed. A legal separation. That's, that's really what happens with sin. Sin creates a legal separation. Because God says at the very beginning, if you sin, if you disregard me, if you stop loving me, if you're disobedient to me, you break this relationship. And God says in many passages throughout the Bible, the effects of that sin means that legally, I need to punish you. I have decreed it, and sin must be punished. But God doesn't want this relationship with the people that he loves to end in separation, in a divorce, in God going this way and people going that way. 
God loves his people. God says that so marvelously and so powerfully in the book of Hosea. How can I give you up? My heart is charged within me. All my compassion is aroused. Now, people of God, I I assure you of this. If there's a couple that's in trouble in their marriage and they're just not getting along and they can't work things out. And they agree that they need to go to a counselor and they need help. They need to talk to a marriage counselor and, and they're facing each other in that room and they begin to talk through the issues. And one of them says to the other, how can I give you up? My heart is changed within me All my compassion is aroused. (laughs) And the other one looks at the partner and says, I know. Me too. At that point, the counselor is going to think, this is going to be okay. This is going to work out. There's hope for this couple. And they're crossing their arms and they're looking the other way and they're just saying there's no way because you did this and you did that and they're blaming each other. Then the counselor is going to say, well, I don't know. But at the point where, where one of them says, how can I give you up? I love you. And the other one says, me too. And that's what God is saying. God knows all of the wrong of his people. God knows the mistakes that you've made and that I've made. God knows the times that we've failed him and that we've cheated on him. God knows the times that we've really messed up. But God says, it's not finished. It's not over. I'm not writing you off. I love you. And God determines that he's going to do something about it and there's a hard route to reconciliation. And, and, you know, when the couple is there in the counseling room and they say, but I'm not ready to, to end this, that doesn't mean that suddenly it's an easy road to joy and peace. There's hard work and it, it takes work from both sides. Both need to be committed. But God takes the initiative and God says, I am committed to that hard road, that hard route to reconciliation. And this is what it takes. It takes the harsh humility of the stable. It takes Jesus Christ, the glorious Son of God, to leave the comfort and the splendor and the honor and the glory of heaven and to come down, down, down to our level. It takes the glory of the Son of God who in compassion, in love, says, I will sacrifice myself for you. I will will give up the glory of heaven. I will die for you. It takes the harsh humility of the stable. It takes a temporary home in a broken world. Jesus giving up all of the glory of heaven and walking on our territory. It, It takes Jesus giving up the splendor of the presence of God and becoming one of us, taking our place. It takes the suffering of the cross where Jesus doesn't just say, I'd die for you, but he actually does it. You know, there are those romantic moments when in 
the relationship of a couple. One says, I love you so much. I would die for you. The one person says, yeah, you keep saying that, but you never do it. (laughs) With God, it's more than just, I'll die for you. Jesus does it. Jesus shows the extent, the depth of his love. Jesus shows his sacrificial commitment to this marriage relationship between God and his people that he actually dies for us, takes our place. And that reminds us, encourages us, underscores for us the hope of heaven. And and now don't think of heaven as a specific place. And don't try to picture exactly what heaven is going to be like. But just think of heaven at this point as the relationship restored. Paradise regained. The home reunited. The relationship reconciled. The bridegroom and the bride celebrating together. That's more than a honeymoon. You know, when the couple goes off on the honeymoon and they enjoy their time away and they have the time of their life, they also know that the sun sets on the honeymoon and they come back to the real world and all of life continues again. And it's kind of back to that world because we know the honeymoon doesn't last forever. But in this relationship that God offers to us, in this marriage proposal that God has for us, it's not just a temporary honeymoon. God says this is forever. This is eternal. This is so that you can be my people and I will be your God and live in that relationship for always. He offers us an everlasting home of perfection. He he offers us paradise restored. He offers us that relationship with, with him that's not marred by our sin, by our unfaithfulness, but that is crowned by the love of Jesus. An eternal communion with the God of love. That's why Jesus came from heaven to earth. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what the child who becomes king is really all about. And so people, this morning, Christmas morning, as we think of Jesus who came from heaven to earth, whose birth gives us the hope of reconciliation with God, of a relationship that's restored, of a marriage that's not null and void, we have to ask, how do we respond? God has given us that heartfelt, gracious, loving proposal. God has said to us, if you accept this plan... And if you accept the fact that Jesus came to pay for your sin and to make it right, then you can live with me forever in this bond, in this union. And you and I need to say this morning, so how do we receive those words? How do we hear that? And we might say, well, You know, I have said yes to God a long time ago. I have already accepted that invitation from God. But if you look at your life and you see times where where you haven't done what was right by God, times when you've let God down, times when you have trivialized that relationship with God, and made it less than what it really ought to be. 
or perhaps times when you've been downright unfaithful to God and broken your promise. This is an opportunity to renew the vow. This is an opportunity in your heart to say, Lord, I'm sorry for the times when I didn't keep my part of this union and I've failed you and I'm sorry. And I thank you, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to start over once again in that union. And maybe some of us are on edge about this and we're saying, but that's a major commitment. You know, you don't just say yes to God and then go on your way as if you haven't made that vow, haven't made that promise, and that's true. It is a major commitment. And what gives us the confidence, what gives us the hope that we can ever with serious intent enter into that kind of a relationship with God. And it's not because of who we are. It's not because of our goodness or our track record. But it's because God has come to us and has just said, how could I ever give you up? All my compassion is aroused for you. I love you that much. Can't you hear God saying that through Jesus Christ, the Son who came, the one who left the glory of heaven, who came to the cross and died for you? And he's asking us today to simply say yes. I make that vow for the first time or I renew that vow. I accept this proposal of an eternal love relationship between God and his people. God delights to hear us say yes. God wants you today in your heart, in your mind, to say yes, I'm in. I appreciate what you have done through sending Jesus Christ and I'm in. And I will be faithful to you and I will live within that holy bond of covenant between you and your people. And I will honor you in that. And I, I will let that bond, that holy bond between you and your people shape the way that I have relationships with others. With a spouse, with a friend, with family members, with neighbors, with people that that are in this world because I, I learn from that faithfulness and commitment. God wants to hear that. And you can say it silently in your heart as an individual, but it, it's also meaningful for us because the bride of Christ is not just individuals. The bride of Christ is the body together. The bride of Christ is all of us being prepared for that day when Jesus Christ will return and we together with the, the people of God all over are the radiant bride joyously meeting God and saying, come, may that day come, may it come soon. And so it's appropriate that we all together would make our commitment, would repeat our vow in the presence of God with all of us as witnesses that we would say amen to that proposal from God. And so I invite that we do that together as the bride in waiting at this moment of a wedding rehearsal, as we wait for Jesus to come again, that we would all say together, amen. If you're in, if you're part of that bride, say it now, amen. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, what a glorious, glorious thought that Jesus loves us so much. Knowing the cost, knowing the sacrifice, knowing the pain would leave heaven and come to earth. Father, we pray for that glorious day when Jesus will return and we pray that each and every one of us that has said amen this morning may be faithful to that promise when Jesus comes again. So help us, Father, to love you and to anticipate that day of glorious celebration. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.